everyone, Mrs. Lopez here. All right, so we're gonna go with chapter 12 of Judy Bloom's Fudgerama. Here we go, chapter 12, Baby Feet. Mr. Fargo set up an outdoor studio in the side yard. He spread his canvas on the grass like a rug. On Saturday morning, I saw him climb a ladder with a bucket of blue paint. When he got to the top, he tossed it at the canvas. So when Sheila screamed, Mrs. Hatcher, come quick, fudge is all blue. I figured he'd gotten into Mr. Fargo's paint. Grandma and Mom came running from one direction, me and Jimmy from another. Fudge was sprawled out on the ground near his garden. His face was streaked with blue, his shirt was stained blue, his hands were blue, he had blue in his hair, even his tongue, which hung halfway out of his mouth, was blue. Mr. Fargo's going nuts, gonna go nuts, I told Mom. None of us are supposed to go anywhere near his art supplies. I don't think it's paint, Mom said, spying an empty fruit basket on the ground. She picked it up and waved it at Fudge. Did you eat up all the blueberries? Fudge moaned. You ate our blueberries, I said. Jimmy and I were on our knees more than two hours picking them, and Grandma was going to bake us a pie. I didn't eat them all. Fudge said in a very small voice. Turtle ate some. You fed Turtle blueberries, I asked. He liked them. He's a dog, I said. At the sound of his name, Turtle appeared from behind the bushes. He plopped down next to me. Let me see your tongue, I said, opening his mouth. Blue. His tongue and teeth were all blue. Fudge clutched his stomach and moaned again. Boy, are you going to be sick, Jimmy told him. I already am, Fudge cried. My tummy hurts so bad. I'm not surprised, Mom said. I know exactly what he needs, Grandma said, heading for the house. She came back with that peppermint medicine we get every time we have an upset stomach. Down the hatch, she sang, feeding him one teaspoonful. How about some for turtle, I asked. Why not, Grandma said. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. I held turtle's mouth open and Grandma poured in a spoonful. Blue gas. Jimmy whispered. He's going to make blue, steamy, gurgling gas. I don't want blue gas, Fudge cried. What are you talking about, Mom said. There's no such thing as blue gas. There is if you eat enough blueberries, I told her. Really, Peter, Mom said. Let's not make this any worse than it already is. Dad missed the blueberry adventure. He'd gone to the town dock right after breakfast to see about renting a sailboat. By the time he got back, Mom had carried Fudge to the porch, where he lay on the cold wicker couch. Everyone gathered around the blueberry boy. Everyone had suggestions for him. Lie on your tummy, Fudge, Mrs. Tubman said. That's what I do when mine hurts. A hot water bottle, Mr. Tubman said. That'll fix it. Make beautiful pictures in your mind, Buzzy Sr. suggested. Just throw it all up, Mr. Fargo said. Sheila was about to say, ew, disgusting when dad ran up the port steps. I've rented a nice little 19 footer, he announced. You could tell he was really excited. We can take a picnic lunch. He stopped when he saw Fudge. What's wrong with Fudgy? He asked mom. Why is he all blue? It's a long story, mom said. I'll tell you about it later. Dad paused for a minute and shook his head. Then he said, well, I've got the boat from noon to four and I can take up to six passengers. I know Peter wants to come. How about the rest of you? I've never been sailing, Jimmy said. No problem, Sheila told him. I'm an expert. I'll explain everything to you. Somebody should tell the Guinness Book of World Records about her, I thought, since she's the world's leading expert on everything. Count me in, Grandma said. Count me out, Buzzy Sr. said. Buzzy, Grandma said, you don't like sailing? About as much as fish like to be out of the water. Mr. Fargo said, thanks, but no thanks. Mrs. Tubman said she really wasn't into water sports, but she'd go if Mr. Tubman, Tubman would. Mr. Tubman said he had no sailing experience, but he'd always wanted to give it a try. What about Fudge? Sheila asked Mom. Fudge isn't going anywhere, Mom said, except to the bathroom, Jimmy whispered to me, and we both cracked up. All seven of us piled into the back of Mr. Fargo's truck. Have a good sail, he called when we, he dropped us off with our gear. The boat Dad rented was tied to the dock. It looked kind of small, especially next to the really big boats that were moored in the harbor. As soon as we were on board, Dad handed out life jackets. 
There was one for each of us, and Dad's rule was we had to wear it all the time. Then he started to explain the man overboard rule. Excuse me, Mr. Hatcher, Sheila said, but couldn't we call it the person overboard rule? I mean, man overboard sounds so sexist. Okay, Dad said, the person overboard rule. He appointed Mrs. Tubman and me official spotters. If anyone fell in the water, our job was to point. No matter how the boat turned, no matter how it rocked, the spotter had to keep pointing to the person overboard didn't get lost. Maybe I should just wait here, Jimmy said. Nah, once we get going, you're going to like it, I told him. I don't know, Jimmy said. I'm not the world's greatest swimmer. Nobody's going swimming, I said. The water's so cold, you'd have hypothermia in a couple of minutes. Hypo who? Jimmy said. Hypothermia, I said. That's when your body temperature falls really low. Most people who die when they fall in the water die from that, not from drowning. I think Jimmy would have jumped back onto the deck if we hadn't sailed away right then. Ooh, my hat, Mrs. Tubman cried as we got going. The wind took my hat. We watched it slow drift, we slowly drifted down into the water. Sorry, Jean, Dad said. You should have pinned it to your hair. I didn't know, Mrs. Tubman said. Now you do, Dad told her. I really like that hat, Mrs. Tubman mumbled. I don't think Dad heard her. He was at the tiller, which is the stick that steers the boat. Soon we were moving along really fast for a sailboat. I liked the whoosh, whoosh sound as the boat cut through the water. Dad relaxed a little, so did the rest of us. We held our faces up to catch a few rays. Don't forget to use plenty of suntan lotion, Grandma said. Sheila slathered it all over herself. By the time she was done, she smelled like a coconut factory. I never burn, Jimmy told Grandma. Me neither, I said. Aren't you lucky? We sailed along that way for an hour before Dad called. Anybody ready for lunch? Yes, we all answered at once. We dropped anchor near a small island. I handed out our lunch bags. Jimmy had brought his favorite, sardines and onions on rye. The rest of us had cold chicken left over from last night's dinner. Am I hungry, Jimmy said, gobbling up his sardine and onion sandwich and starting on the next. Me too, Sheila said. I've never been so hungry in my entire life. It's the salt air, Grandma said. It does wonders for your appetite. The three of us polished off a bag of chips, a box of cookies, and all the juice. Then we hit the fruit. Don't stuff yourselves, Grandma told us. It's better to eat lightly when you're sailing. But we're anchored now, Jimmy said, helping himself to a second peach. Grandma raised her eyebrows. After lunch, we relaxed a little. We relaxed for a while. Dad took a snooze, Grandma and Mrs. Tubman, had a heavy discussion about the problems of the city. Mr. Tubman read a mystery and the three of us played hearts with the deck of cards Sheila had brought with her pack. I'm always prepared, she told us. After a couple of hands, she said, speaking of prepared, is there a bathroom on this boat? Look around, I told her, do you see a bathroom? Since we were in an open boat, it didn't take much to figure out the answer to that question. Well, what's a person supposed to do, she asked. A person is supposed to go before. I did. Then a person is supposed to wait until we're back. She checked her watch. That's almost two more hours. If it's an emergency, Dad has a bucket, I told her. A bucket? Sheila said. That's disgusting, Jimmy and I sang at the same time. Just when I think it's possible that the two of you are human beings, you prove that I'm wrong. Sheila's outburst woke Dad. He checked his watch. We better get started. We'll be heading into the wind on the way back, so it's gonna take longer. Once we were underway, it felt a lot colder than before. We put, pulled on sweatshirts. Sheila shivered and moved closer to me. I moved away from her and closer to Jimmy. It got more and more windy as the sky filled with big gray clouds. The boat tipped and water splashed all over the rail, spraying us. That's when Jimmy grabbed my arm and said, I feel funny. Dad, I called, Jimmy feels funny. Keep your eye on the horizon, Dad told him. What horizon? Jimmy asked. His eyes were rolling around in their sockets and he was turning green. Grandma said, breathe through your nose, Jimmy. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. There were waves now with white caps. The boat tipped way over and Sheila screamed, do something before we all drown. It's all right, Grandma said. This is a keel boat. It can't go over. 
It can't go over, I told myself. It can't go over. Jimmy was trying to breathe through his nose, like Grandma said. I think he was more scared than sick. A puff is coming, Warren, Grandma called. A puff of what? Sheila cried, grabbing me. A puff of wind, Grandma said. Look at the water. You see how it's rippling in front of us? Then she shouted to Dad, Warren, head up to the puff. Head up in the puff. All of a sudden, the boat, which was already tipped halfway over, tipped so far the sails touched the water. The tubmen screamed and clung to each other. Sheila dug her fingernails into my hand. Jimmy groaned and hung on to me. He breathed his sardines and art onions right into my face. Let Muriel take the tiller, Mrs. Tubman yelled. You want Mur Muriel to be captain? Dad said, fine. Really, Warren? Grandma said, you're overreacting. But she switched places with him and took the tiller, shouting out oars. Ease the sheets, Warren. We're going to sail off the wind. It might take a little longer, but we'll be... We'll all be more comfortable. The boat straightened up and sailed more smoothly. Jimmy released his grip on me. So did Sheila. Her nails left marks on my hand. The Tubmans breathed more easily and Dad sulked. Grandma sailed the boat in like a pro. She explained everything as she did it to make us feel more secure. Now, as we pull up, Warren will jump onto the deck, she said. And while he ties us up, I'll drop the sail. She looked over at Dad. Wait for me to give you the war signal, Warren. But Dad didn't wait. He jumped too soon and landed in the water. Person overboard, Sheila shouted. Mrs. Tubman and I remembered our responsibilities. We pointed at Dad. We pointed as some guy from the dock reached into the water and pulled him out. We pointed at someone else. We pointed as someone else wrapped him in a blanket. We pointed until Dad looked at us and called, Okay, that's enough. You can, can stop pointing now. He was shivering so hard his teeth clicked. Mr. Fargo picked us up in his truck. As soon as we pulled into our driveway, Sheila jumped out and ran for the house. I have to go so bad. Did you all have a nice sail? Mom asked the rest of us. Then she noticed Dad. Warren, how come you went swimming in your clothes? Dad didn't answer. Uh, I'll be in the tub. He managed to say heading for the house. Mom looked at Grandma. What happened? She asked. Oh, the usual, Grandma said, but all's well that ends well. Fudge jumped off the porch steps. All's well that ends well, he sang. I see he's recovered, I said to Mom, more or less. Then Tootsie toddled over and put her arms out on up to me. Up, P, up. I picked her up. She was barefoot, and the bottoms of her feet were covered with blue. Did you get more blueberries, I asked Mom. No, why? Look at Tootsie's feet. Oh no, Mom said. We ran to the side yard where Mr. Fargo had left his work. Mom sucked in her breath when she saw the path of little footprints across his painting. What are we going to do, I asked. What can we do, Mom said. Mr. Fargo and Jimmy came around the house then. Jimmy was telling him about his sailing adventure. I was never scared, he said. I knew it was a keelboat. I knew it couldn't go over. He stopped when he saw us and gave me a weak smile. Peter wasn't scared either, he added. But Mr. Fargo wasn't listening anymore. He'd seen the footprints across the painting. His face turned purple. I held Tootsie tight and waited for the explosion. Frank, Mom began, but Mr. Fargo held up his hand to stop her from speaking. He got down on all fours and crawled around his canvas. He stood up and walked away from it. Then he came closer, then he walked away, then he came closer again. He squinted, he scratched his beard. We held our breaths. Finally, he muttered, baby feet. I looked at Jimmy. He shrugged as if to say, don't ask me. Baby feet, Mr. Fargo said again, coming toward me. I backed away. He wasn't getting his hands on my little sister. Itsy bitsy baby feet, Mr. Fargo cooed. Itsy bitsy teensy weensy baby feet. He tickled the bottoms of Tootsie's feet. She squealed. Then he laughed. Mr. Fargo actually laughed. How would you like to be my partner, Tootsie Pie? She held her arms out to him. He swung her up in the air. I think we've got something here, he told her. I think those little baby feet of yours are going to be a big hit. None of us knew what he was talking about, but we were all relieved. That night after summer, supper, Jimmy and I used up a whole jar of Noxema. We had sunburned face, necks, and ears. Our ears hurt more than anything. Why didn't you use suntan lotion, Mom asked. I never burn, Jimmy said. Famous last words, Grandma said. 
Then Dad, who had his supper in his room, came down in his robe. He clinked the spoon against the glass and said, I'd like your attention for a minute. Everyone looked at him. I behaved very badly this afternoon, he said, and I want to apologize to everyone on the boat, but especially to Muriel, who saved the day. Apology accepted, Grandma said. I was so proud of Dad for admitting that he acted like a sore loser. So when he looked over at me, I gave him the high sign and he smiled. Then Mr. Fargo clinked the spoon against his glass. He stood up and said, I want to thank Tootsie for walking across my canvas and giving me the idea for a series of paintings called Baby Feet. Here, here, Buzzy Senior said, raising his coffee cup. Let's have a toast to Baby Feet and the Muriel, who always saves the day. He gave Grandma a big kiss. Grandma blushed. Buzzy, she said, not in front of the children. Somehow I don't think Grandma was talking about us when she said children. I think she meant Mom and Dad and Mr. and Mrs. Tubman because they were the only ones who looked surprised by that kiss. And that's the end of chapter 12. Stay tuned for the next video, chapter 13. Bye everyone.